Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Well, I'm here with my new friend, Elizabeth Nolan Brown. She's a senior editor at Reason Magazine, where she covers politics of speech, sex, tech, justice, prohibition, and panic. And fortunately, there's no panic anymore, right? We don't have panic in our, in our politics at all. No, so, no, no. Well, welcome so much to the paradox. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, I thought I'd go with something non-controversial since we've been spending so much time talking about COVID and other things. I thought, hey, let's talk about Roe Wade. I don't think it would. Like abortion is really not a hot topic, so so thanks for thanks for addressing this issue because I know you know this is something that you you focus on at times of reason. Um, so let's begin, I guess, with background. So as we're recording this right now, it's uh, mid May, and there's a, been a leak at the Supreme Court that the ruling in, in June will overturn Roe Wade, which is something that's sort of been brewing, it seems to me, for many years in the sense that. It's kind of like a flimsy sort of judicial standing, whether whatever, however you feel about abortion, it feels like it was kind of a kind of a, a, a dicey sort of, I guess, ruling and using the ninth and I think 14th amendments as the basis for it. So it looks like it's gonna be reversed sometime in June, about a month from now. And of course there are legal ramifications for this and you know, national implications, both political and, and you know, cultural. Why don't you kind of give a backdrop, backdrop, I guess not so much about the leak so much, but what you think the implications are for this, for just abortion and just the country in general? Yeah, um, I mean, that's, it's so broad because I think that this has wider ranging effects than most people are, are thinking about in the short term right now. But um, obviously, you know, the, the first one will be that if Roe is overturned, it will revert back to being a state issue about whether or not abortion is legal. Right now, um, up until the point of viability, you know, abortion, has to be uh, has to be legal under under Roe v. Wade, and that's why a lot of states who have, which have passed laws saying abortion is banned at six weeks or eight weeks or uh, you know even fifteen weeks um, are are not allowed to do that. So it would go back to the states. Um, I think we would see a huge range of different sorts of laws. Um, but already, I kind of I wrote down a few things to say what states already have. So some states would immediately go, it would almost certainly be banned, if not immediately, then very soon. Um, in 22 states already, there would be certain bans pretty much triggered as soon as Roe was overturned, because um, nine of them have pre-Roe bans on abortion, which would then go into effect again. 13 of them have trigger laws, which say that if Roe is overturned, abortion will be banned at, at some early period. And this isn't, these aren't all total bans, but um, the, they're different parts, you know, like earlier than they are now. There are currently um, five states that have near total bans that have been blocked by the courts, but will be able to go into, but aren't, and so they're on the books still. So they're not being enforced, but if this is overturned, they'll be enforced. And then there's um, 11 states that ban it at six weeks, plus Texas, which is a weird one. Maybe we'll get to that. And one state bans it at eight weeks, and four states have a constitution that says that it, abortion can't be done. So there's a lot of states where it would immediately go into being illegal um, at some or all stages of pregnancy. Of course, the other side of that is that, you know, we would see it be, be legal in very many states. And um, this would have, you know, a weird effect on, on the actual ability to get an abortion, right? Like in some states, even if there's a near total ban, people could travel out of state. Um, sure. In, in, you know, there's been some studies on this, like the, uh, a woman at Middlebury College named Caitlin uh, Knowles, she projected that if 22 states had a ban, abortion would only fall by 14%. Um, in Texas, where the six week ban took effect um, last year, you know, it only went down, I think, by uh, the New York Times analysis said by about 10% based on data from the UT Austin. Um, so because people are traveling out of state to get to get abortion still, or they are getting abortion pills mailed to them. But, um, you know, I think that this then also, in addition to obviously 
people might still have access, but it's going to be a lot harder for women to get an abortion, a lot, you know, harder to terminate a pregnancy in general. Um, but we'd also see new mechanisms pop up to try and prevent this too, like a new war on abortion drugs, a new, you know, um, laws against sending them across state lines and, even maybe states try to ban travel across state lines for an abortion, which would be unconstitutional. But I think, you know, there's all sorts of new terrible things that we might see. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, there's no limits to what governments will do to try and control control the population for whatever it might be. So I think it's very interesting you mentioned a couple of things. For one thing, it goes to the states. So every state is going to be different. And the politics of it is, of course, different depending on the state. And I would say, probably, I'm guessing, within within the state, it's different, right? Like an urban versus rural versus you know, north or south or east or west, whatever, wherever people tend to live, you know. But so there are four states that actually have it in the Constitution. It seems to me that that'd be much more difficult to change those laws, right, than, than one where they've got a, a trigger uh, where, you know, when Roe is overturned, they have a trigger law. When most of these trigger bans or, and actually there are some, I think, the opposite, right? They're trigger sort of once, it, you know, if Roe Wade's overturned, we're going to have these automatic laws that go into effect. Like I think New York had one of those in Virginia, right? But they sort of pass these the you know, viability up to, up to, right, up to 40 weeks, you can go have abortion or something. Uh, are there, were a lot of these pass, laws passed within the last just few years? It seems like everyone's kind of waiting for this or are these, are some of these like, you know, 20 years old and now that it's finally going to come into play? Yeah, most of these have been passed in the past few decades. Um, when we're talking about, like I said, I think there were the eight states that had pre-row bans, but then most of these have been passed, um, you know, recent in the past since row, and I think more of them since you know uh, the past twenty years or so. Um, when yes, this has obviously been you know just such a huge issue. It's funny though because I think that there's this idea that if row is overturned and this isn't you know maybe the politics of abortion will calm down because this is at least a theory I've heard like you know that it won't be we we'll won't be fighting over Supreme Court justices so much. It won't be as important, you know, across the nation to get everyone, you know, for Congress and things like that. And I just think that that's probably pretty naive because it's going to be even, it's going to be such a huge battle in every single state. And then also we're going to be still battling even more for um, control of the federal government because, I mean, these laws will obviously have new abortion bans and new restrictions on abortion will still come before the court. And also we're going to have people trying to, uh, in Congress, trying to enact federal bans, or perhaps if that's, you know, not, not uh, viable at the moment, you know, going for other things like, you know, bans on mailing abortion pills across state line or, you know, traveling uh, on doctors on performing abortions, even if it's legal in their state on someone who comes from out of state where it's illegal, I think. So it's still going to just be a huge issue in national politics as well, I, I'd imagine. Yeah, well, I can't. I can't imagine not being an issue in the sense that it, if it's it's people are so passionate both sides, and the the tricky thing about this too, and when you try to define pro-choice, pro-life, it's such a broad and I think a a poor way of sort of defining it because you know as someone who supports abortion at, from anywhere after three weeks, I mean, some people could say they're pro-choice, some people they're pro-life, depending on sort of how absolutist you are, right? Like what at what limits you think you know you're not pro-life unless you're you know, you're against IUDs and against, you know, right. Uh, right? I mean, <clears throat> and so practically, it sounds like it, it's not going to have a huge effect. This is obviously a medical podcast. I talk, it's not just for physicians, it's for not for lay people too, and sort of what's going on in medicine. What are the implications for physicians who are performing abortions or who are thinking about it? Because, I mean, I like, you know, in this, my state of Michigan, it will be, I think it'll be revert to a felony as soon as you... Um, because it goes back to like 1931 law. I imagine that will change, but at, as of now, that's what it will happen. Is that common other places or, or do you also have patients potentially at risk for being you know, prose prosecuted for you know, manslaughter or, or murder or whatever? I don't think it's common that anyone criminalized under, under current, I mean, not under current laws or pre-existing laws. Um, I, I don't actually know how many states though that is the case, but I do know that that it is the case in some, and I imagine we'll see more. Um, you know, Texas right now under their their ban, which is you know um, for people just in case you don't know, it's it's a ban at six weeks that is not enforced though directly by the state, but it's enforced by civil lawsuits. So anyone who thinks that someone performed an abortion um, in in you know a contradiction to the law can sue. 
and it can be anyone actually, not even anyone in Texas, it can be anyone out of state or anything. They can sue the person that they think um, performed the abortion or aided and abetted the performance of an abortion and get um, a minimum of $10,000 in damages for each illegal abortion that was performed. So I think we will see, we're already starting to see other states introduce laws like that. I think we'll see more of that. We'll also see, like you said, the direct criminalization of, of doctors. Um, and then also like Louisiana has already introduced a bill that they're considering um, to criminalize people who get abortions. So I think that will be much more rare, but as but definitely not unheard of, um, which will be interesting to see how that the effect of that would have on on the politics of this too. I mean, obviously it's terrible. I don't mean to just be like, it'll be interesting. I think it, that'd be terrible, but also yeah, yeah, yeah. it could, you know, really most people, I think, even when they're talking about wanting to stop abortions or wanting abortion to be legal, they don't want to criminalize the women involved um, who get abortions. And so, yeah, I think that could really change the politics of this and where lines are drawn if that's a thing that starts happening. Is that a is that an emphasis of the right to life organization that they are they pushing for the criminalization for or is, is it that they'll use any strategy or tactic they can to minimize the amount of abortions occurring in different states and just based on what the state is that they'll use whatever not me I shouldn't say means I don't make make them sound so uh, conniving but like just you know it's sort of like you know you look you look to to limit the abortion in the state you different tactics right it, you know it might be different in Utah than it is in Maryland for instance so. Is that is it right to life pushing a lot of these things, or do you think it's just people just trying to figure things out politically? I think it's yes, people trying to figure things out quickly. I don't think, I, and again, I'm not sure on what right to life like official stance has been. Um, but for the most part, any of the big abortion organizations, oh, sorry, anti-abortion organizations have avoided um, pushing criminalization even for doctors for for the most part. I think because. There's just been so much other territory, like if it's just, you know, um, there's been much more focus because because Roe was in place and Casey has been much more focused on things like making sure doctors have to get admitting privileges, making sure people have a waiting period, making sure people have to have their clinic walls this big by this big, you know, it's it's been much right. more focused on lots of little incremental steps that make it much harder for abortion clinics to operate and stay open or much harder for people to actually get abortions out them more than these big picture bans. But now that, that, you know, maybe all bets are off, everyone's like, oh my gosh, like kind of, I think a lot of state legislators uh, who are, you know, want to make a name for themselves or, and I don't, I sound very cynical who maybe, you know, really, really believe that this is the important thing to do to are immediately like, wow, like, where can we go with this? And then are, you know, excited to introduce things that are much broader than we've previously seen. I feel like with the, with Roe Wade and the, the situation, I mean, you don't look, you look younger than me. I mean, you don't know like a world without Roe Wade in existence. Right. I mean, I, I certainly don't. And so, you know, I can't even imagine. I I can't imagine what it used to be like. I'd honestly not a historian and familiar. I mean, I hear stories, and I think some of them are a lot of them are sort of uh, sort of exaggerated in both both ways. Is my my impression? But um, it, it's hard to imagine. A, a, it, it actually for many times I felt like both sides were arguing and knowing that nothing would change. That it was like you know we can we can fight. It's a way to raise money. It, I was very cynical about it, thinking that this is. You know, oh, we don't want the wrong Supreme Court justices. We don't want the wrong congressmen or senators because or president because that's gonna you know they could change abortion. And we all kind of knew like, yeah, it's really not gonna change anything. I mean, you may you may nibble at the edges one way or the other, but ultimately it's still gonna be the same. Now it definitely feels very different, and I feel like a lot of these people who were sort of always you know championing this now we're gonna be faced with a decision of the expectation that actually have to do something about it, right? Like before you could have said I'm definitely pro-life or I'm pro-choice, and now you actually have to stick your neck out there and actually do something and pass a law. I mean, I, I and I think it, do you think it's going to be more effect, more important at the state or the federal level with that, with that sort of attitude or will that matter? I think, I mean, it'll be, I don't think there'll be any shortage of people trying to do things at the federal level, but it, it will be very impossible to get much done at the federal level. Um, 
except for, you know, this is why I think the, the abortion pills thing might be one avenue you could, because I don't, I don't know, but what exactly could be done, but I imagine there are some things that could be done through like the FDA and I mean, cause the FDA is the one who said they could be sent um, through the mail and done through telemedicine now. So, you know, a Republican administration could have the FDA say like, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do that anymore. Um, but I think, you know, the states are obviously the, the place where the actual difference will be made because, you know, so, yeah, states can enact these bans or, you know, other, other sorts of restrictions. And just to go back to what you said before too, it is really interesting how people describe themselves. Um, you know, I think there was like, there was a study, the most recent study, you know, only 19% of Americans think abortion should be banned in all circumstances. But I think an even smaller percent think it should be legal in all circumstances. Most people are, are totally for it up until the you know, first three months. Then in the second trimester, it gets you know, a little bit less people are supportive. Um, so there's that. Like People are very much not sure. You know, people have all sorts of different limits on where they think it should be legal and not. Um, I know a lot of libertarians also who describe themselves as, well, pro personally pro-life, but politically pro-choice because you know, they are uh, very morally opposed to abortion. They think it's wrong, they that, you know, think they would not get one, they think that they should work to make it less, so that less people choose to get them or need to get them. But they also recognize how prohibition works and don't have any belief that, you know, a government, that, that the government has the right to do this or that the government would be able to do it in a way that wouldn't be just a complete mess and and not actually stop abortion, but rather just invade all sorts of privacy and stuff. So I think I think there are a lot of people who have of those sorts of views too. Yeah, well, no question. I mean, and I feel like when it comes to prohibiting people from crossing the state lines, I I think you can you can make an not an argument, but you certainly can see how people could say, well, you know, mailing stuff across state lines, although we mail stuff all the time and it's not really subject to restrictions all sorts of medications but um you can definitely see how they could in a federal level you can maybe make some sort of thing preventing people from traveling across state lines i mean you can only say if you bring something back that's elite contraband right like you can go and bring you're, you can be arrested if you bring fireworks that are that are legal in your state but they can't prevent you from going to the other state and buying the fireworks right i don't think that's in any law at any time um so yeah i guess i guess I suppose it'll be just interesting to see how this plays out and i, I kind of tend to think well and I'll just use my state as an example that I think is unusual. And you know, we have this ban from 1930s, I guess, that said that abortion is legal. And I cannot imagine a time when the state of Michigan, you couldn't, because politically, I feel like our state is purple to slightly blue if you had to pick some spot. And so it's probably relatively like moderately pro-choice, I guess you'd say. Part of the state is, is not like where I live is actually very pro-life. The other side of the state in the Detroit area is very pro-choice. And then kind of in between different where depending where you go. And so you have prosecutors have already said that they're not going to prosecute this this law, the state law. Uh, other county prosecutors have not said, but I mean, because it is a felony, I think, in the state of Michigan. If you do, I think things may change. But it, it'll be interesting to see how this this works itself out, because at some point you've got to reach a new equ equilibrium, whatever it might be. And I don't know, maybe it's just pass it. I guess I wasn't even aware that Roe was only was not okay to do abortion all the way up until birth. I thought, it, I didn't realize it was just a viability, which is like, what, 22 weeks or something like that now? Yeah, it obviously has kept getting pushed uh, pushed back. I don't, I don't know what it was when Rose started. I think it was a little bit forward. And forward. Probably about 28, I'm guessing, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, yeah, I wonder too if we'll see like sanctuary states, kind of like we've seen with immigration laws and with, um, and with gun laws to a, to a point, sanctuary states or sanctuary cities that say like, if there is some sort of federal law saying, you, you know, doctors here can't, doctors where it's states where it's legal can't perform abortions on out of state. I don't know how that, that would actually, if that would actually pass constitutional muster or anything, but, but you know, whatever kind of federal restrictions are passed, you could have states say like, no, we're not, we're not enforcing that here. Um, with cities, I think it's much, I don't think cities have much of a right to not enforce state laws, but you could see some of them trying at least. Well, I mean, certainly it, it depends on who's enforcing the law, right? Like if you yeah. only have, you only have so many state troopers in a state, right? Like I know the state of Michigan, there's only a couple thousand, 
they couldn't possibly prosecute and do, I mean, there are all kinds of other things happening, like, you know, car accidents and murders and stuff they have to take care of. I mean, I guess they could emphasize, you know, abortion providers to do a couple of them. So like the SEC to try and make an example of people to, to cut down on it. But, you know, generally, I think most of the law enforcement comes down to the county level. And so if the county sheriff or the prosecutor is not going to do it. They're just there's not much you can do about it, I suppose. It's sort of like federal laws, right? In some ways, the, the states don't cooperate with the feds. They can't really enforce a lot of these laws because they don't have enough agents, right? right? Uh, do you do you see that? Do you see the things happening? I mean, I think at this point we probably feel confident that the Supreme Court is going to overturn this, right? I don't think that this is a red herring or anything. Do you see the court at some point either expanding it or kind of reining in a little bit, or do you think it's going to be? pretty much status quo for a while, they're not gonna try and touch abortion for some time. I don't think the current court would do anything different, you know, so it could be a long time before anything would change. Um, <laughs> so, well, yeah. No, that's I, that's reasonable. I mean, I think in some ways the court's like, we've decided this now, we're not gonna yeah. try and touch it. I mean, they did a long, they spent decades avoiding uh, taking up the issue, even though, Arguably, they may have had the votes or something, yeah. I guess. I don't know. Uh, I like uh, the theory. This is, I don't think this is likely at all, but uh, someone would put out there that maybe the court has actually decided on like a 15 week, like, you know, upholding the Missouri's 15 week ban. So, sort of moving that, the viability point or, you know, moving that rule back, but not totally overturning Roe. So, that could be why someone leaked it because they either are mad about the decision and want to maybe change the outcome or because they, um, they want to soften the blow of the 15 week ban by being like, well, look, it could have been worse. Um, <laughs> but I guess there's a very small chance that, that that could be what's going on. So what do you think about the, the broader political ramifications? I mean, we're looking at a, we're in a situation now where pretty clearly the Republicans are going to make some big gains in the, in the House and the Senate. Uh, it's obviously no presidential election right now, but in the state houses, they're probably gonna do fairly well, you'd guess in general with the, I guess we'll call it a debacle. I mean, as far as the COVID policies have been, and certainly the, the economy is not doing well in the stock market. Do you foresee that this sort of thing would make a big difference? Or do you think it's the leak has happened almost so early that by the time elections come around, it's people are going to, it'll sort of like already be in the past, you know, with the news cycle at this point? Yeah. I mean, the, the big question, I guess, is will it energize Democratic voters to? get out or will it energize like, you know, undecided voters to, to vote Democrat because they're saying that they will do something about this. Um, and I don't know. I don't think right now in the short term it will actually, because I think anybody who who is going to vote based on this would probably already be voting Democrat. I guess, you know, it could energize them possibly to, to get out and vote more, but I don't, I don't know. I think that, that I have a hard time believing it would. Yeah, that's obviously what the Democrats want and are kind of banking on. I don't know that it will work, but I do think that in the long run, it will. Like, if abortion is criminalized, you know, illegal, and especially if it's criminalized and you start seeing the effects of these policies in certain states, I think that could really drive um, a lot of liberal activism and, and votes in, in the long run. But I think that'll have to happen once we start seeing how this plays out when it's not so theoretical. Yeah, right. Well, and that's always when reality runs into theory, right? At some point, you gotta have the implications of arresting, arresting women who are having abortions, arresting physicians, and you know, people go on hunger strikes, or there's some sort of you know, story that, that occurs and that people either rally around or not. But I mean, I would just, personally, I, I don't hear anyone in, around me talking about this, which is surprising, because it seemed like a really big deal. And now, it, I, when it came out, now I feel like, I don't know, no one, no one's talking about it. It, it surprises me because it, I feel like in the 80s and 90s, this was like, people always were talking about abortion, even though nothing happened. Yeah. And now, and now it sort of happened and people are like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> I, maybe I'm just totally that's, off, but that's stupid. And people are talking about it a lot on the internet, I know, but um, I don't know. I'm, I live in Ohio now and I'm just surrounded by my nice Midwestern family and they don't really politics in general so, <laughs> so i don't really have a good sample size to go on about what people are talking about here 
How, and that's a, a question I for so you're a reporter in, you're in DC now you're you know you're in Ohio, Ohio permanently or yeah great um you not a, not permanently, but we came back during the pandemic and then we had a baby so we're we're here for a while yeah well much easier having a baby there than in DC that's yeah. for sure uh, <laughs> so um what do you think the the implications are for for then a, abortion well I guess I guess for reporters how do you get a feel for what people are talking about because always all the time I hear these stories about oh you know it's just what's going on in DC is very different than what's going on I don't know where I live and what people are talking about or what that um, you know what drives people do you do reporters live in as much of a bubble as I think they do in DC and New York and where they don't really have a feel for what and I hate to say regular Americans because those are Americans too but you know like now you're in the Midwest you know it feels different right but and you grew up there, so you know it definitely was different. But what I mean, what do you think about that as far as reporting on and your know, abortion is certainly one issue because it's obviously very different in DC and New York than it is in many parts of the country. Yeah, I definitely think that there is a bubble in, in DC and New York, and it's it's sort of to the detriment of of our politics, our discourse, whatever you want to call it, that um there's been such a consolidation of of media into these these two cities because uh Yes, a lot of people are are so in a bubble about what everyone's talking about. I feel like I've always been lucky that I do have, I just said my family doesn't talk about politics, but you know, sometimes, sometimes they do, especially with my mom and dad. I can talk to my mom and dad about it. I can ask them to tell me what their friends are saying about things. I mean, I feel like I've always gotten a better perspective on on what, uh, you know, Ohio is, is what the bellwether <laughs> says. So I've been, you know, able to, to get some of that. Um, Twitter and other social media other as also, you know, I I think it gives reporters more insight into what people outside of just uh, you know, DC or New York or wherever are talking about, but it definitely distorts perceptions in another way because the people who are on Twitter and Facebook fighting about politics tend to be the people who are both like the most invested in it and also the the fringiest, I think, on both sides. Yeah. You know, they're, they're the, the what's the, the squeaky wheels, the loudest, or whatever that saying is. So I think you know, you get this sense that there's such an urgency or there's such polarization about certain issues when the actual, if you look at people out in the you know out in the world or on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, it's actually much more moderate. But it's just that you know you hear you hear the loudest voices and people. I think reporters tend to think that that's what everyone is thinking. Sure. Well, I mean, you look at conflict, right? <clears throat> so yeah. I think taxes are too high, taxes are too low. And some guy's like, I think taxes are about right. Well, that's never a story. The guy's like, yeah, taxes are about right. I mean, that's, <laughs> right. that could be most people, right? No one's ever going to talk to that person because it's not interesting. <laughs> They're not asking for any change, right? And so, I mean, I, my impression of Twitter certainly is maybe just Twitter, especially, it seems to be really he heavily influenced by the media and they are very much get their story ideas and a sense for sort of what is okay and not okay on Twitter, which I find very strange because honestly, most people I talk to, they're not on Twitter or at least that I'm aware of. And yet I feel like a lot of policies even sort of formulated on Twitter to some respect. Yeah. I mean, does that yeah. seem accurate? Do you feel that's yeah. true? Very much like talking points I think that are acceptable are sort of hashed out in real time on Twitter um, about different issues. And yeah, I, I think that's 100% true. Yeah, and else and how has um, no, yeah. Okay, go on. Sorry, uh, lost my. No, time. that's fine. Um, so finally, I guess when it when it comes to oh, abortion, I sorry, oh, I don't go ahead. Just Twitter does not drive media traffic either. That's what's so interesting. Um, I mean, this is the case at Reason, but this is the case at anybody, any publication I know reporters at, which is a lot of publications, and it's like Twitter is just not a big traffic driver in the way that. Facebook is or um, other sort of search engines are or whatever. It, it's Twitter is so minuscule in, in terms of how much traffic it actually drives to websites. Even if you get a thing that's got thousands of retweets in article, very few people actually click on the article. So it's just, it's weird in two respects because it's like, it's not actually that good for journalism, even though we're all spending all of our time there. And also it just shows you how many people are just like formulating their opinions based on the tweet, you know, or the headline versus versus actually reading anything you write. Well, and I think that's, I mean, that certainly is worth Facebook, but with Twitter, 
almost more so because I think that's kind of, I mean, it is a sort of a, a platform that it just promotes headlines, right? I mean, it's 240 characters or whatever it is, that's about, you know, the first, what, two sentences maybe of, a, of an article at most. Yeah. And so that's all you can convey. So you are going to be just, you're probably on that site, not for long, deep reading. I mean, there are other people who have the threads that are, you know, 27 tweets long, but I'm guessing they don't get a huge engagement unless they're really good. And so then you have essentially the, the people looking at that site are not ones who are going to click into an article anyway, because they're probably, you know, just got two minutes or something or whatever. I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's interesting that it doesn't actually drive article yeah. viewing, but. The flip side though, is that it is the best place if you want to reach like, I don't know, uh, talk about something and reach people who are making policy or who are like working at think tanks or who are very interested in niche subjects. That is the really good place to like reach each other and, and get those ideas across. So it's, I mean, I love Twitter and I think it's very useful in many ways, but also well i mean sort of the sort of the former president right he was very yeah. he made he made his living on twitter i mean that's why he i that was in large part why he was so successful because he's so good at it for what some people just speak in headlines i guess that's what he <laughs> guess that's what he does uh i guess the, the last question i was going to just finish with is when it comes to the fall i mean what, what do you see the next one to two years when it comes to abortion and what the landscape looks like in, the, in this country is it just going to be really fractured and depends on where you are that some people are going to really travel like, you know, hundreds of miles for abortions, or do you think it's going to be kind of like it is now? Or what do you think the, you know, we're going to be looking at coming, going forward? I mean, I don't imagine states that are, I think the states will pretty much keep going in the directions they've been going in. You know, the states that have, we've been seeing try to pass 15 week bans, 16 or six week bans, you know, um, extreme restrictions on abortion in other ways will will keep you know we'll pass total bans or we'll pass you know very early bans and the states that haven't i don't i don't expect much is going to be changing from where states have already been going um unfortunately you know like a lot of the states that that are very anti-abortion are, are clustered so like the south you know like there's already very few abortion clinics there so if if a bunch of southern states you know pass abortion bans it's people there are going to have right right now, like say people in Texas, they can travel to one of very many neighboring states and get an abortion. But if you get a whole cluster of states that don't, then like you said, people are going to have to travel very long distances for things. Um, I don't know. I think that it will re-energize. It'll re-energize like you said, um, we were talking about earlier, like, you know, democratic politics, I think, and obviously Republicans too. Maybe it could re-energize the middle, though, because I think right now, as you were saying before, like with with everything sort of so theoretical, it's been very easy for people to be like, no, like, you know, abortion is murder, like ban it, criminalize it and other people to be like, no, like, you know, we must have whatever. And we've we don't hear the, the middle, the people who are the large percentage of people who are like, you know, like, I think it should be legal up into through the first trimester or maybe somewhere in the second and, you know, things like that. And with it actually not just being theoretical anymore, we maybe we'll hear like uh, hear and see a an ascendancy of of this actual sort of practical middle way on things. I, I don't yeah. pull out a lot You're of so hope for that. Like, <laughs> no, no I, but I think you know the practical aspect is you have to at some point you have to follow come into some okay. policy that that can be enforced or not enforced, right? And so whether that's you know trying to really you know, crack down people crossing the state line or blocking drug purchases, or that's arresting people who are performing abortions, arresting people who are, you know, or whatever. I mean, at some point you have to come to some sort of conclusion that's that your state is generally comfortable with. But, you know, I'm sure depending on the state, it's going to be different. Um, so I, you know, I, I find it fascinating in some ways, just like you, it's interesting. It's kind of a, it's a, Subject that I oftentimes don't like to think about too much because it's not something that impacts me a whole lot, but I don't know. Uh, I guess when it comes to your writing and where people can find out more what you're writing about, obviously you also write about panic. <laughs> what is, actually, I have to ask you, what are the, what are the politics of panic? Or is that, <laughs> that was, that was um, a well, great line in your bio. You know, because the other things I write about, I write a lot about like um, sex policy and crime and um, things related to free speech, things related to tech. But there's also a category because I do a morning newsletter for Reason, Reason Roundup, which just sort of tackles whatever is is in the news that day or that week from a, from a libertarian perspective. Um, 
And there's a big category of things I do, which are don't fall under any of my typical beats, but it's just like debunking the wrong thing that everybody is freaking out about on either the left or the right or in general and sort of just debunking this like crazy conventional wisdom that will, that will like run amok on social media and everyone will be, you know, thinking that it's yeah. true. And so, so sort of a uh, throwing, throwing cold water on these like moral panics, I guess, just re regardless of what realm they, they crop up in is, is one of the sure. things. That we, I we have, we have plenty of those things, right? Where there's uh, the actual data sh does not suggest that right. what is you know being talked about is like as you know pretty common as people make it out to be. Or, like you know, I think when we're well, I'll say when I was a kid, you know, it was always the kids getting abducted uh, by strangers and you know milk cartons and all that kind of stuff. And not to say it didn't happen, but it was extremely rare, right? Or sort of like school shootings. Yeah, very, that was actually uh, they the do yeah, gonna say was abductions is a really good one because people always think that that you know the, the stranger danger is like one percent of of cases or something like that. Right, and I think also like uh, what assault and sexual assault on campuses is another one that I think was always overblown yes. as far as uh, how happen often it actually happens. Well, if you want to find out more stuff, what you're doing, what's the best way to get a hold of your writing and to see check you out online? Um, uh, visit reason.com. Or, and where you can also subscribe to my morning newsletter, The Reason Roundup. Um, and also you can find me on Twitter, uh, this beautiful hellscape of a site at uh, E N Brown. All right, Elizabeth Noel Brown, senior editor at Reason Magazine. Thanks so much for joining The Paradox. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what The Doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher and share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash the paradox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com.